passionate about music. Now, Debbie, there is a fantastic new book which you can go out and get. It is absolutely... I, I can't put it down. It is the definitive biography of Freddie Mercury. The writer is Leslie Ann Jones. Leslie joins us now. Hello, Leslie. Leslie. Hi there. Leslie, it's hard to talk to you because I've actually got, in honour of this interview, a Freddie Mercury tash on. Are oh, you wearing yours? I'm wearing you know, it now. They sent me one for the Freddie birthday party at the Savoy on the 5th of September. Oh. And when I got there, they said, OK, where's your tash? I said, I'm wearing it in a very private place. <laughs> oh my oh. my tash fell off in excitement there. It I is, might wear mine it's in gone a to join private. mine, I think. Oh, no. <laughs> I might wear mine in a private place as well. Okay, a little bit too it's much. It's a bit itchy, I've got to All right, say. ladies, please, please, thank please. you. This is about Freddie Mercury, not about where you're he wearing your tashes. He would have loved it. He would have loved <laughs> yeah, you're it, darling. Right. Yeah, he'd what, have been the first to laugh, he would have. What I love about your book is that you knew him, so uh, you, it's like an insight, there's a bit of a reportage going on, and you've, you've interviewed loads of people who knew him as well in the book. But what I want to know though first of all is when did you first meet freddie and what was your first impression of him first met him in 1984 i was working for the daily mail as a rock and pop correspondent oh wow all the tabloids had such a thing in those days because <laughs> actually rock and pop had just become mainstream at that stage it's hard to imagine now but it was a very sort of early toe in the water and the daily mail sort of came late to the party but said oh we better have one as well so we'll get her and they nicked me from the sun actually uh, so I was sent off to interview uh, Freddie and Brian at the Queen production offices in, in Notting Hill. And Freddie was actually quite anxious and nervous and very quiet, didn't say much. Brian did most of the talking. Freddie laughed at a few gags because Brian's a very funny man. And when he, he'd laugh spontaneously, his hand would fly up to his face to cover his teeth. And I thought, how sweet. And I just fell in love with him there and then. And I, I just wanted to take him home and get my mum to cook him a roast and stick him in the bath and give him a good scrub. It's not that he was dirty, but, you know, I just I felt sort of very maternal about him. And yeah. that, that never really left me, I think. And you also, what was the story in the book where you, you met him in a bar somewhere, which was a little bit more sort of uh, intimate, you know, social? Yeah, quite a lot of water had gone under the bridge by then. I'd sort of joined them on tour a few times. I'd been at Live Aid with them. And then, then in 1986, they did their second... Um, it was the Rose Dawn in Montreux, which was a huge television festival at the time. And all the delegates from all over the world would converge on this very dignified, elegant little resort and raise hell once a year. And uh, Freddie, obviously, Queen had some studios, some recording studios there, Mountain Studios. So they, they partly lived in Montreux anyway and I'd sort of ducked out of this party at the conference centre up the road and wandered down to a pub which Rick Wakeman had tipped me off that Freddie would, would drink in because it was the pub that anyone who was recording in Mountain used to go down to it's called the White Horse still there but they called it the Blanc Gigi which I thought was hilarious <laughs> and, and there was Freddie sort of hanging around with a couple of his, his little friends and uh, he was looking for cigarettes he'd run out of cigarettes and I was with a journalist from the, the Daily Express a guy called Roger Tavener who was sort of he was new to the game as well and we just teamed up and we were hugely competitive we, we were trying to outdo each other at every turn <laughs> and one thing led to another I think just because we were being cool and not hassling Freddie and not running up and saying oh can we get an interview he was quite interested because he knew who we were obviously he'd seen us around I'd been on the road with them he, he knew exactly who we were and in the end he came over to us and we, we got into conversation and he really opened up that night actually and I, I felt very sorry for him because it only sort of dawned on me afterwards. He must have known then in 1986 that he was HIV positive. He must have known that his days were numbered. But he was making the best of it and giving it a good go. And we, we ended up going out on the town, if you can do such a thing, in a place like Montreux. And at one point, we went back to the Montreux Palace. We nicked all the furniture out of John Deacon's room just for a laugh. And that was as rock and roll as it got. Oh, you know? I love there was no driving a Rolls Royce into a pool or chucking tellies out of windows or anything like that. But... but yeah, he'd sort of calmed down a bit by then, though, hadn't he? Very much so, yeah. And, you know, they'd had their wild days pretty early on. They'd had a very long career by then. Um, and Live Aid had given them a new lease of life. But the tragic dimension of that was that Freddie was going to die. So, so really, that second crack at the whip was very short-lived. And I always thought that was such a shame. Can I ask, was, did, he, did, you think, did he know during Live Aid then? 
I don't think he had had his diagnosis then. And if you look at footage of Live Aid, and certainly on the day, I mean, he was a strapping. Yeah! Sort of image of fitness. He was dripping fitness. Um, and it was his day. He just went out there and absolutely smashed it. And everybody knew at the time that it was happening that Queen was stealing this show. Yeah. There was no greater band on the earth at that time. What was it like for you, Stuart? You were on the side of the stage watching <gasps> no! that. You were watching know. history it's, happen. You know, I'd never get a look in now. I'd get oh. turned away at the gate these days. But back then, things were different. You know, it, it, it worked differently. If you were invited along, you were part of the thing. A friend of mine, Bernard Doherty, PR, he was looking after the, all the publicity on the day. And he did a magnificent job of getting the right journalist into the right place at the right time. And I think he had eight AAA backstage passes, which he had to share around, literally hundreds of journalists. And he'd come up and he'd go, right, here's your pass, get in there, you've got 45 minutes, get no! in, get in, get what you can, get back out. And actually, everybody went along with it. It was fantastic the way it worked. What's your, what's your sort of big standing memory of that day then? It was the moment Queen went on, and I wasn't actually standing there watching at the time. I was backstage, and I think I was ogling David Bowie or something <laughs> similar. At the time. And then suddenly this blast came from nowhere, this sound, and everybody stopped talking backstage and looked at each other, looked up at the monitors, which were all around the backstage area, and thought, oh, my God, who's getting this sound together? Everybody looked to the monitors. Some of us ran up on the stage, stood in the wings, and just stood there open-mouthed. It was extraordinary. Because what they'd done, which we didn't twig at the time, they'd got their sound engineer to go up, round to the monitor, sneakily whack it up. So they were louder than everybody <gasps> else Cheeky. on the day. It was such a simple thing to do, but nobody else had thought of it. And the other thing that they did, they'd rehearsed. And I think nobody else had. I mean, I remember Francis Rossi saying to me, you know, we, we were rubbish. We went out there. We hadn't played together for maybe a year. We just went out and did it and realized, in retrospect, that actually we should have done some work. But Queen had. They'd just come off the road. They went into the Shaw Theatre for three weeks, rehearsed. They did a medley of their greatest hits, because how do you choose when you mm. have such a long career and so many songs to choose from? And they did. They blasted it for 18 minutes. They did exactly what Bob Geldof asked them to. In a way that nobody else really did. So that's why they were the best on the day. It was no accident. You, uh, well, you knew him, didn't you? I did know him. And I, you know, it's, it's hard to compute now. Uh, to think that I actually got on Learjets with him. I got into limos with him. I went to dinner with him. Played Scrabble with him. He did tequila shots with him. Did all kinds of naughty things <laughs> back then. Uh you know, a lot of what happened on tour stayed on tour, frankly. We won't probe them. Get, get, <laughs> get, some, tequila. get some tequila, Neil. <laughs> his yeah. private life, mm -hmm. I didn't realise he was kind of confused about his sexuality at all. He seemed such a confident guy. I didn't realise that he struggled with it the way he did. The reason being that he came from a very strict religious background. He'd been born on Zanzibar, as you know. Uh, his family was Zoroastrians, Parsis, which is a strict monotheistic religion and culture, quite similar in some ways to, to Judaism. Um, and there were strictly divined, defined expectations and guidelines, and Freddie's inner turmoil was that he wasn't able to live up to that lifestyle. He had to conceal a lot of his inclinations from his parents because he couldn't offend them. And so... I absolutely understand why he never came out in his lifetime, which I think people tend not to remember now. He's known as a great gay rock icon, but he never admitted that in public during his life. Mm. As far as the world was concerned, you know, I think the music industry knew he was gay. Probably most of the fans knew, but it wasn't, it wasn't the defining factor. He was very private about his private life. And also the fact that the two most important relationships he'd had were with women. He'd fallen in love, deeply in love, with two women. First of all, Mary Austin, who was his first girlfriend. And he was so devoted to her, she, she stayed his best friend for his, the rest of his life. He left most of his fortune to her. And she was his old faithful. He, he never gave up on her. But then he went to Munich to record with Queen and met Barbara Valentin, who I also spent time with in Munich. She's absolutely wonderful. <gasps> Poor lady's dead now, but she was a, a kind of a Jane Mansfield figure, you know, a very big, busty, very loud, very sexy lady. You'd go out with her and people <laughs> would step aside, you know. And Freddie and she had enjoyed this mad, passionate affair. They'd bought a flat together in Munich. And 
he was the love of her life. She used to come and stay with him in London very frequently, and she'd go on the road with them as well. And she was fantastic. And I think what Freddie loved about her was that she was a big maternal figure that he could absolutely be himself with. He was a, a gay man who loved women. Yeah, quite definitely. Clearly. He adored women. Yeah. He liked. He loved yeah. the way we smell and the way we dress. <laughs> and he he loved sort of ladies who are uh, sort of confident, big characters. He loved people like Elaine Page and Anita Dobson. Uh, you know, p- larger than life females. He absolutely would have loved to be Liza Minnelli. I think. <laughs> <laughs> well, he was good friends with her, wasn't he? And he he loved the gay scene as well. I mean, he he discovered uh, himself a lot. I think from the sounds of it in New York, where he was going to the club, the Anvil and he saw uh, YMCA village people for the first time there and uh, also that's where he got the kind of leather clone oh, look it? from yeah. yeah you yeah. know if we think back to how gay culture was at that time things were changing very rapidly um, the legal status of gay men was changing very rapidly at that time and we take a lot of that for granted today but it was quite revolutionary what was going on in New York back then and I think Freddie found this a whole new lease of life he couldn't believe that he could go there and open up and be himself, pardon the expression, but just uh, just kind of become the real Freddie. And he explored everything to the hilt. And at that stage, New York was the, the centre of his world. Now, I need to talk to you about his coming out song, because there's a really interesting theory in the book by the lyricist Tim Rice, who is basically suggesting that Bohemian Rhapsody was Freddie's way of telling the world that he was gay. Oh, my goodness, the lyrics! Yes. It's such a great theory, isn't it? And yeah. when Tim and I were having lunch, actually, he's a really good friend of mine. I love Tim. Absolutely worship him. Worship the ground he walks on, dear. <laughs> he, uh, we, we were chatting away, and he said, you know, I always thought that Bohemian Rhapsody was Freddie's coming out song. And I said, ah, okay, I hadn't thought of that. What, what do you mean? He said, well, if you think about the lyrics, it's, it's Freddie saying, that's who I was. I'm saying goodbye to that Freddie now, and I'm going to now be this Freddie. But it was quite obscure. But think about it. Mama just killed a man, put a gun against my head, pull the trigger, now he's dead. You know, he, he's, he's saying goodbye to the old Freddy, the one everybody expected him to be, and he's now being honest with himself about who he really is. And when Tim said that, it absolutely fell into place. I thought, you're right, you know. And I said, do you think he... He achieved it. Do you think he was succeeding at that, becoming the different Freddy? And he said, I think he was managing it pretty well until he got sick. And then the emphasis changed. But Freddie never explained the lyrics of Bohemian Rhapsody. He, he just would wave it aside. And if anybody said, what does that mean? He'd say, oh, it means whatever you want it to mean, darling. You know, don't ask me. Um, but if you really go back to the lyrics and look at them, I, I think there can't be a person on the planet who's into music who doesn't know the entire lyrics yeah. to that song. Yeah, I, but I've never heard it. Is that? Like that's that. changed yeah. how I... Yeah. I see a little silhouette yeah. of a man. That's him. So, so, so he's being haunted still by the old Freddie, yeah. trying to yeah. leave him behind, but he's never going to leave completely. Shall we do the Fandango? <laughs> Thunderbolt oh, and lightning. Very, 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 very frightening. frightening. Go! And then I was in Budapest uh, with Queen. They were, they were doing a, a show behind the Iron Curtain, which was still then in place. Massive historic show. And we were at a party in Freddie's suite. And, uh, you know, I jump in. I did get a bit of cheek going, and I ran up, and I said, so come on then. I said, in, in Bohemian Rhapsody, bow rap, as we called it, Scaramouche, this, this amazing clown figure from the Italian Commedia dell'arte, I said, that's you, isn't it? And Galileo's got to be Brian, the sort of father of modern science and math and physicist and so on. And then, then you've got Beelzebub, who's got to be the sort of devil, Roger, who was the wild party animal. And then I'm thinking John. So John Figaro, you know, not the sort of great operatic character, but the little tuxedo kitten in Pinocchio, maybe, the Disney movie from 1940. Freddie just looked at me as if I was completely <laughs> mad and then walked away. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, this is the most art fueled yeah. breakdown of the song I've ever heard. Yes. But there are so many theories. But I said to somebody the other day, you know, some people say they're bored with that song. It's been around too long. We've heard it way too much. You don't really hear it anymore. I don't think that. Every time I hear that song, and I must have heard it thousands of times, I hear something new. And there aren't very many songs that you can say that about. I think Freddie also, and, and definitely the group, just transcended sexuality. Because my brother, my one of my eldest brothers, is a right butch bloke. If You know, he would never have thought Freddie Mercury was gay. It was even of issue. Mm. He appealed to absolutely everyone, didn't he? Sexuality, like you said, very intelligent, the four guys. Sexuality is one 
aspect of the whole of the of the person you know Brian and Roger and John didn't jump about going, yeah, well, our front man's gay, but we're not. Uh, there was mm. no reason to explain. There was no apology to be made. It was all embraced. It, it was regarded as part of his personality and the intrinsic Freddie. It was just one aspect of him. No big deal was ever made of it. And I think it's such a shame in some ways, although I can understand why, that he couldn't be more open about it during his lifetime. I think that his death would have been, if it could have been, a much more positive experience for him had he been able to be open. There's a suggestion in the book as well that if he had been a bit more open, maybe he might have survived that, that period and, and the sort of HIV infection. He might have lived a bit longer in time for the drugs to kind of be more able to help him. Not sure about that. I mean, he didn't curb his lifestyle. I remember Paul Gambatini saying that he bumped into Freddie in heaven one night and said, you know, in the light of what information is now coming forward, what we now know, he said, are you curbing your behavior? Mm. And Freddie said, no, I'm doing everything with everybody, really? darling. <laughs> Men, women, you know, you name it. And Paul said he knew at that stage that we were going to lose him oh. because... There was almost a bit of a death wish thing going on. He knew that if he carried on living like that, this would kill him. But much in the same way as James Dean didn't stop driving fast cars, even though he knew possibly he might crash one and die in one, didn't stop him doing it. Why do you think that was? I think you get to a stage where you've just you've found your thing that thrills you, and maybe you've also partly had enough. You know, Freddie was never going to make old bones, he used to say that. And I think dying at 45, which is relatively young, you know, he's that age in perpetuity. He's kind of lucky in a way, because he, he never wanted to be a fat, bloated old queen. As I would have it. still have loved him as a fat, bloated old queen. I would have too, but oh, you know, it's I'd not really our here. opinion that counts. I'd rather he be here. Do you think, because I saw a documentary about him, um, that his long-term partner, I can't remember the chap's name. He Jim Hutton. That's Jim Hutton, mm. um, who he lived with, didn't he? He lived with in London. But Freddie Cur he obviously had an open relationship with him because he was still sleeping with other people. Why do you think he he did that when he had he had his partner back at home? I think that there's some misinterpretation about that. Once he knew that he was HIV positive, he stopped sleeping with everybody. Mm. That's very clear, you know. And his relationship with Jim from that point was exclusive. He stopped sleeping with Barbara as well. But at one point, you know, there was a whole coterie of them going on. And why not? You know, it's the way he chose to live. But once he knew, he curved his lifestyle and he and Jim did settle down into quite an, uh, a normal uh, sort of husband-wife relationship if you like. Mm. I, do you know I could talk to you all day. It's it's just such a fascinating... And you too. Oh, <laughs> stop it, Leslie. Well, and stop. Stop. Yeah. What time do you get off? <laughs> <laughs> it's about music.